Life in the 1800s was, for all too many, characterized by hard work, jobs that were difficult, dangerous, physically demanding, and chronically underpaid. Sweatshops were notorious for these poor working conditions, where women, predominantly, toiled long hours on unfair wages, sewing for the garment industry. Sweatshops could be found in large cities like New York, that featured large immigrant communities hidden in back alley slums. Women, whose alternative employment opportunities were few at this time, were exploited as cheap labor, often working in overcrowded and stuffy rooms, prone to pest infestation and outbreaks of fire. The sweating system and its arduous conditions weren't just a feature of poorly regulated factories or workshops where several or hundreds might be employed. The clothes industry employed middlemen that operated between the manufacturer and the worker. The sweater, to cut costs, subcontracted garments for finishing to women working from home in the miserable attics of overcrowded tenements, who, through the constraints of childcare, sickness or lack of money to travel, could find an income, however meagre it might be, in sewing garments. Today, in an account by Louis Albert Banks, 1855 to 1933, a pastor concerned with the struggles of Boston's poor. You will discover the terrible lives of impoverished women working in the city's garment industry in the 1890s. He was determined to expose the forgotten victims of greed who worked and starved in cellars and garrets rather than beg or steal. Find out how the sweating system was so exploitative that seamstresses paid by the peace had little choice if they were to feed their children and keep a roof over their heads, but to work long hours on a poverty-inducing wage until they dropped from exhaustion. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. In not less than a score of Boston streets, conversing with the sewing women, looking on their poverty-lined faces and their ragged children, breathing the poisonous air of the quarters where they work, and listening to their heart-rending stories of cruelty and oppression, would be an appropriate summary of our observation. It is my purpose at this time to take you with me on a tour of observation, as well-lighted streets are better than policemen to ensure safety and good order. So I believe that the best possible service I can render the public is to turn on the light and tell, as plainly and simply as I can, the story of what I have seen and heard and smelled in the white slave quarters which are a disgrace to our fair city. I shall confine myself at this time entirely to the work of women and children in their own homes. Most of this work is parceled out to them by middlemen who are known as sweaters. That word sweater is not in the old dictionaries. It is a foul word, born of the greed and infernal lust for gold, which pervade the most reckless and wicked financial circles of our time. The sweater takes large contracts and divides it out among the very poor, reducing the price to starvation limits and reserving the profits for himself. Some of the women whose story I shall tell do not work for sweaters, but are treated almost as badly by the powerful and wealthy firms who employ them. In these cases, the firm itself has learned the sweater's secret, and through an agent of its own, is sweating the lifeblood out of these half-starved victims. Let us begin near at home with a South Boston case, which came to my notice through the dispensary doctor for the district. It is a widow with one child, a little boy scarcely three years old. The child is just recovering from a troublesome sickness through which the doctor became acquainted with her. She has been sewing for a good while for one of the largest and most respectable dry goods houses on Washington Street, 
a firm whose name is a household word throughout New England. Her sewing has been confined to two lines, cloaks and aprons. For some time she has been making white aprons, a good long apron, requiring a yard, perhaps, of material. It is hemmed across the bottom and on both sides. The band or apron string is hemmed on both sides and then sewed onto the apron, making six long seams. For these she is paid 15 cents a dozen, and besides that, this great rich firm, whose members are rolling in wealth and luxury, charges this poor widow 15 cents expressage, transport, on her package of 10 dozen aprons so that for making 120 aprons, such as I have described, she receives net 135 cents. If she works from 7 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night, she can make four dozen. But with the care of her child, she is unable to average more than three dozen, for which, after the expressage is taken out, she receives... Forty cents a day for the support of herself and child. Her rent for the little room is one dollar per week. It is idle to say that this firm is compelled to do this by competition, for the material and making of these aprons cost less than ten cents, and the firm retails them ordinarily at twenty-five cents apiece. On cloaks she did better receiving from fifty to seventy-five cents apiece, she furnishing her own sewing silk and cotton. On these she could make, by working from seven a.m. till eleven p.m., nearly a dollar a day. But she could never get more than six cloaks a week, so that the income for the week was about the same. Now come with me a little farther around the harbour. Let us climb up three flights, to a little attic suite of two rooms, so low at the side that, with my length of anatomy, I have to keep well to the middle of the room in order to stand upright. Here live a Portuguese mother and five children, the oldest thirteen, the youngest not yet three, a poor, deformed little thing that has consumption of the bowels, brought on by scanty and irregular food. Its tiny legs are scarcely thicker than my thumb, and you cannot look at its patient, wasted little face that looks old enough to have endured twenty-five years of misery instead of three without the heartache. I ask the mother how she earns her living, and she points to a package that has just come in. Picking it up and untying the strings, I find there six pairs of pants, cut out and basted up, ready for making. Looking at the card, we are astonished to find that it bears the name of one of the largest firms in the city of Boston, a firm known, perhaps, as widely as any. Three pairs of these pants are custom-made. They are fashionable summer trousers, with the names and addresses of the men for whom they are made tacked on them. The other three pairs are stamped with New York, as customer from which we infer that they are made for a New York house, the Boston firm acting as sweater. This woman and her little children must finish these pants by the same hour tomorrow, when the messenger from the store will bring a new lot and take these away. She receives ten cents a pair, three pairs being custom-made pants. In order to finish the six pairs in the twenty-four hours, she must get to work at six in the morning and improve every available moment until eleven or twelve in the evening, and sometimes, if the sick child is fretful, until one o'clock in the morning. Her wages for this tremendous strain that is wearing her very life away until she looks almost as frail as her dying child is sixty cents. Her rent for these two small attic pockets is one dollar and fifty cents per week. She has one bed for herself and five children. Only through the aid of the Boston Baptist Bethel 
is she able to keep up the struggle? And yet, O oh my brothers, this is in sight of the old North Church, and the tower where they hung the lanterns for a signal to Paul Revere, when he rode through the darkness to arouse the fathers to fight against oppression. God help us to hang another light for liberty in the midst of this cruel slavery. Perhaps you are tired now and want to rest, but I am insatiable and will go on. Let me give you the record of six families found in the same tenement. Family number one. They are Italians. The wife and mother is finishing cheap overcoats at four cents apiece. She can finish from eight to ten in a day. She has two finer coats, lined with handsome satin. Of these she can complete only five a day, and receives eight cents apiece. There are three in the family, and they pay a dollar and a half per week for their one room. I asked about the husband, and a neighbor, woman from the next room, remarked contemptuously, He is no good. Number two. These are Poles. The woman makes knee pants of grammar schoolboy size. She receives sixteen cents a dozen pairs. Two dozen are as many as she ever gets done in a day. Number three. They are Italians here, and are at work on knee pants. This woman receives sixteen cents a dozen pairs, for most of them, but for some extra nice ones she gets eighteen cents a dozen. She has two dozen brought to her from the sweater's shop every day about two o'clock. She works from two in the afternoon until ten at night, and from six in the morning until noon the next day, to complete her allowance, for which she receives from thirty-two to thirty-six cents. The rent is a dollar and seventy-five cents per week. She has two children. Number four. This woman makes men's pants at twelve cents a pair. Formerly, when she was stronger, she could drive herself through six pairs a day. But now, with a little babe to look after, she can get only four pairs done. The room is intolerably dirty. But how can you have the heart to blame her? Number five. Polish Jews. The woman makes knee pants, working from seven in the morning till ten o'clock at night, and nets from twenty-seven to forty-four cents a day. Number six. Italians. This woman is an expert seamstress. She is finishing men's coats at six cents apiece. And with nothing to bother her, working sixteen hours a day, she makes fifty-four cents. The rent for the narrow little back room is one dollar and thirty-five cents per week. If you want variety, we will climb four flights of stairs, with half the plastering knocked off the walls, and talk with an English woman. She is working on fine cloth pants. She gets thirteen cents a pair. By working till very late in the evening, she can complete four pairs a day, and thinks it would be almost a paradise if she could make her fifty-two cents every day. But it is one of the characteristics of a sweater to systematically keep all his people hungry for work, and she seldom is able to get more than twelve pairs a week. She lives alone in a little sweatbox under the roof, for which she pays a dollar and a quarter per week. Not far away, up two flights, we find a Portuguese widow, with four little girls, the eldest fifteen, the next thirteen, and the younger ones three and six, respectively. They are all dwarfed by hardship and insufficient food, so that the one who is fifteen is not larger than an average girl of twelve. The mother is sick, and the girls are trying to keep the wolf from the door by carrying on the sewing. They are all hard at work. They carry the pants back and forth themselves, and so for the most of their work receive twelve cents. Though, for some, 
they get only ten cents a pair. They have only two little rooms with the most meagre furniture. The rent is one dollar and a half per week, and the sick mother and four girls huddle together in the one bed at night. They are pretty, bright-faced, intelligent girls, and with a fair chance would grow into strong, noble women. But one shudders when he takes into consideration the fearful odds against which they have to struggle in this poverty-stricken, crime-cursed alley. Here is another case of similar description only a few blocks away. We go up three narrow flights, steep and dark, for space is as important in a low-class Boston tenement house as in a sardine box. The stairway is slippery from filth on the last flight, for on a small bench at the top, in a dry goods box, a little boy is raising squabs for the market and the pigeon business. However much it may help to pay the rent is not conducive to cleanliness. We find here a suite of three little rooms, the largest of which is not more than ten feet by ten feet. The others are much smaller. In these three little pigeon boxes eight people live, at least sleep, five men and boys and a mother and two girls. The men are off most of the day, and work at such jobs as they find. The mother and little girls make pants for another leading Boston clothing house. The two little girls, the younger only three years, are both overcasting seams. The three make on an average sixteen pairs of pants a week, for which they get thirteen cents a pair. The young pigeon fancier, already spoken of, carrying the goods to and fro. The rent of these crowded quarters is two dollars and a quarter per week. In the same building, downstairs, we went into a room which could not have been more than ten feet by twelve feet, where an American woman, with seven young women helping her, was at work dressmaking. We could not discover whether they were working for the stores or not, but the air was poisonous, and the workers had that deadly pallor which comes from habitually breathing bad air and from lack of sufficient food. Sickness, to be dreaded anywhere, is especially pitiful among these sweater slaves in the city. In the country, the fresh air, fragrant with the breath of new-mown hay, or sweetened from ten thousand clover blossoms, is free to the poorest. But to be sick in a tenement house is something terrible. Yet crowded quarters, poisonous air, and filthy clothing make sickness a common guest in such places. I climbed one day up two flights into a dirty little room, the smell of which was sickening to me in three minutes, and yet there I found a man on a little cot that had been given by the charitable missionary who guided me, who has been lying there for more than three years. For two years and more he had not even a cot, but lay on the floor in his dirt and pain. There are two children, too young to be of much assistance. The wife and mother sews, finishing pants for a rich Washington street firm. She gets twelve, and sometimes, on fine custom-made pants, thirteen cents a pair. She has worked so hard and continuously on poor food and with insufficient clothing that rheumatism has settled in the joints of her fingers and stiffened them, till she is only able to turn off nine or ten pairs a week. Last week she could only make a dollar and fifteen cents. The rent was a dollar and a quarter. They have absolutely none of the ordinary comforts of life. The sick man has no sheets for his cot, and the rheumatic mother sleeps with her children on the floor. Downstairs... We look in on a mother and two grown daughters who are finishing pants for another fashionable firm, one which does a large business with clergymen. They are paid thirteen cents a pair, ordinarily, and for the very finest custom-made pants they receive as high as twenty cents, but complain, as it takes so much longer with the fine pants, that from two to three pairs is as much as one woman can complete in a day. There is a helpless air about this mother, and her daughters that is very depressing. 
There has been quite a controversy recently as to where the new United States postal uniforms for the Boston carriers were made. I settled this question to my own satisfaction during the past week, when, in company with Dr. Luther T. Townsend of Boston University and two other gentlemen, one of them being an Italian interpreter, I climbed the rickety stairs of an old North End tenement house and found the pants for the same uniforms being made by Italian women at nine and a half cents a pair, received from a sweater. One of these women says that, by beginning at four o'clock in the morning, and frequently working until twelve o'clock at night, she can make six pairs of these pants in a day. She has five children. The rent is two dollars per week. The husband has been out of work for eight months. The only one of the children who is able to earn anything is a boy who is a boot black and can earn, in fine weather, three dollars a week. Another woman at work on these postal uniforms, who was not able to labour quite such long hours, could only make four pairs a day. She also had five children, the only one able to earn anything being a daughter, fourteen years of age, who works in a sweater's shop for two dollars a week. On the walls of the rooms in this building where the postal uniforms were being made, the cockroaches were crawling, and in some places were swarming as thick as ants about an anthill. I have my notebooks full of many other cases, including Portuguese, Italian, English, Polish, and a few Irish and American women, of the same general character as those already related. But a similar wicked scale of prices runs through the making of other clothing. I called on a woman in South Boston last week who was making overalls for a city firm at sixty cents a dozen pairs. They are the large variety of overalls, such as express men and such workers use, with straps going over the shoulders. I took a tape line and carefully measured the sewing on one pair of these overalls. When they come to the seamstress, there has not been a stitch taken in them. They are simply cut out. There are thirty separate and distinct seams to be sewed, making in the aggregate thirty-two and a half feet of sewing, for which she receives the gross amount of five cents, out of which she has to pay the carrying to and fro. If she goes after them herself... She can bring only two dozen at a time, which will cost her ten cents car fare, going and coming. When sent by express in a package of five or six dozen, the number she is able to make in a week, she is charged fifteen cents expressage each way, so that the expressage eats up the making of six pairs. In addition to this, the stiff cloth is very hard on machine needles, and she will break about ten cents worth per week. This woman's story is a sad one. Her husband, who was a strong, hard-working man, fell ill through an overstrain and died after fifteen months' sickness two months ago. She has three little children, the oldest four years and the youngest a little over a year, working as hard as she can, driving her machine until late into the night. She is able to make only five dozen pairs of overalls a week, which when expressage and breakage of needles are taken out, leaves her two dollars and sixty-five cents. The rent is a dollar and a half, which leaves one dollar and fifteen cents for the food and clothing of a mother and three children. Of course she cannot live on that, and would starve to death if she were not assisted by charity. And yet there is a firm doing business in South Boston mean enough to take advantage of the fact that people living in this part of the city are compelled to pay car fare or expressage on work secured in the city proper, and so has reduced the price for work given out in South Boston to fifty cents a dozen pairs. I talked with another young woman who has made overalls for both these firms and has been compelled to give it up through sickness brought on from the confinement and strained position of sitting so many hours a day over a sewing machine. 
This poor girl told me that both of these firms were now giving a great part of this class of work to the public authorities in charge of the House of Correction, to be done by the prisoners, and that a daily stint for a woman in prison is only eight pairs. This sick, discouraged girl, in a most heartbreaking way, said she thought she would better commit some crime in order to procure a place in the House of Correction, for there she would have much better quarters, a great deal nicer food, and would only have to make eight pairs a day, while at home she must force herself to make at least a dozen pairs a day, or starve. Fellow citizens, what do you think of this? Is there not something wrong in a system of things that permits the authorities of the state or city to enter into competition with the sewing women of Boston at such a cruel and heartless rate that no woman can work at it and keep out of prison unless she is assisted by charity? The same South Boston firm gives out men's shirts to be made at sixty cents a dozen. The material for one of these shirts costs twenty-three cents, the making five cents, a total of twenty-eight cents. They retail these shirts at fifty cents apiece, making a net profit of twenty-two cents on an investment of twenty-eight cents for a few weeks' time. During the last weeks, as I have gone among these women, my ears have been haunted with human greed. Good, honest sewing women must work at least one-third harder than the prisoners work for crime.'